The Psychedelic Report. Psychedelic drugs have played their part in America's long, strange trip toward an understanding of mind-altering drugs. The Psychedelic News. Leading physicians, scientists, and experts share their wisdom about psychedelic medicines and healing. Fifty years ago, psychedelic drugs were at the center of America's counterculture. The brightest minds in psychedelic medicine. The Psychedelic Report. We use the ketamine-assisted psychotherapy model that happens to have psychedelic effects that were not predicted when the drug was first developed. From researchers to investors. I think the biggest mistake we've made as a culture is the war on drugs. To physicians, to shamans, and nonprofit pioneers. Psychedelic drugs. Recent research suggests some of them could have legitimate uses. The Psychedelic News. Bring you diverse perspectives from the front lines of this exciting movement. The Psychedelic Report. Report. Psychedelic Report was brought to you by Apollo Neuroscience and produced by Future Medicine Media. Welcome to the Psychedelic Report, your single source of truth for the psychedelic news. I'm your host, Dr. Dave Raven. I'm a neuroscientist and psychiatrist trained in ketamine-assisted psychotherapy as well as MDMA-assisted therapy. Hello and welcome back to a very special episode of the Psychedelic Report where we're bringing you some extra love today for Valentine's Day. Today in the psychedelic news, we're bringing you the latest on love, sex, intimacy, and psychedelic states. The Psychedelic Report was brought to you by Apollo Neuroscience, and today we're announcing the release of The Love Vibe by Apollo. The Love Vibe, specifically designed for women, is to help get you in the mood. It's cuddly, warm, snuggly, and intimate. The Love Vibe helps you drop in, sit back, and relax for the good time you've been waiting for. And you can try it today for free on the Apollo Wearable. And today, I'm introducing a very special guest, Jaya, somatic sexologist and author of Your Blueprint for Pleasure. Jaya is an internationally recognized, award-winning sexologist and best-selling author of The Red Hot Touch and Cuffed, Tied and Satisfied. Jaya is the creator of the Erotic Blueprint Breakthrough and the Erotic Blueprint Quiz. Through more than two decades of client observation and clinical research, she discovered a map of arousal that reveals your specific erotic language of turn-on. This revolutionary framework helps you create deeper connections and total sexual satisfaction. Buckle up, because you're in for a ride today. You're listening to The Psychedelic Report. All right. Jaya, thank you so much for taking time to join us. I'm, you know, a huge fan of your work and your approach to the space of uh, sexuality and healing. And um, I just wanted to thank you for joining us today. Such a pleasure to be here. And I'm always just honored to be able to have the conversation on such a topic that we deem so taboo and a lot of people don't want to talk about. So I'm really grateful to be here to share my experiences and also open up this discussion today. You know, one of the things I wanted to talk about that I think comes to the surface for a lot of people is this idea that trauma or things that have happened to us in the past have anything to do with why we might be struggling sexually or emotionally or connecting with ourselves, our partners, et cetera. Can you walk us through that a little bit? Mm -hmm. So trauma and I think it's interesting to just our definitions around trauma and what does that actually mean? Because we throw this word trauma around and there's all different kinds of traumas. But, you know, just looking at it from a brain standpoint and what's happening there, it's like the brain gets stuck. So we talk about PTSD and how the brain gets stuck kind of in this loop of patterning where we have these neural nets, as you know, you know, I'm I'm speaking to someone who knows this very, very well. Um, And so to me, trauma is when we adapt to an adverse situation, something happens, we create an adaptation. And then that adaptation is no longer serving us. And our system doesn't know that that's not good for us. And so it keeps in this adaptation on this cycle and on this loop adaptation is a beautiful thing. It's so good that we are able to adapt. Yeah. Yeah. One of the best things. And so really my definition of trauma is when we have an adaptation that gets stuck and we're now no longer functioning well, because we don't need that adaptation anymore. And our system doesn't realize that it isn't good for us anymore. 
And so this happens in sexuality across the board. I mean, I think we live in a culture where we all have sexual trauma just because we live in such a sex negative culture. You're bad, you're wrong, don't do it. You know, and then we have desire as, and as our hormones are kicking in and then we do things in our teenage years and then we, we experience shame. And then that shame has the messaging of I'm bad, not just that I did something bad, I'm fundamentally bad because of this taboo in our culture around sex. And then we have the medical industry and, you know, just things that happen there from early gynecological exams and how traumatizing that can be to a young person, not understanding what's happening to their body and being stirruped in bright lights and just the way that that things are done. And then we're starting to have a more of a culture of consent, but this idea of consent and, you know, even being told from a young age, like hug your grandma when you don't want to hug grandma, that gives you a message that I don't have agency. And then how does that play out as we um, get older and develop and mature sexually? And then we have things, of course, uh, just to give a little disclaimer, we're going to talk about things that are taboo here on this and also things that could be confronting, but things like rape. Things like saying no and sex still just happening for us in, in those early years. And one of my favorite books, it's called Dilemmas of Desire, and it takes 100 teenage girls and their first experience with sex. And out of the 100, only 98 of them said they had sex that they want they wanted and had planned. So that's a huge 98% of teenage girls are having sex that just happens or was forced or was a very negative experience for them. Only 2% was, was consensual and planned. Uh, yeah. Wow. And that was me. Luckily, I was one of those 2%. I like went to my gynecologist. I was like, show me my anatomy. I want the mirror. I want the charts. I want to know what's going on. You know, I want to become sexually active. So right. what is this thing called sex? And I started educating myself. I would go to the library and I would get like, every book I could, uh, this, this is ages me, but you know, my library card was my best sex educator, sure. yeah. <laughs> you know, going and, and reading all the books that I could, because I knew I wanted to become sexually active and all the sex education I'd had was don't do it. Don't get swell bellied. You're going to go to hell. I grew up very religious. And then there's the religious trauma on top of, you know, the sexual experiences. And so I think that a lot of us are walking around with unhealed adaptations. You know, if we have a belief system that I'm bad and wrong, if we have a belief system that I don't have agency in sex, if I have a belief system that's stored in my body still in my pelvic floor and that this is wrong, that is going, that adaptation then is going to affect how we interrelate with other human beings, not just in the bedroom, but outside of the bedroom as well. Yeah, that's that's so interesting. And I, you know, I love the way you describe that. And I'll try to synthesize what I'm hearing you saying is really difficult, challenging things happen to us in a lot of cases when we're young, sometimes around sexuality, sometimes not at all. Um, and you know, when we have those really challenging experiences, it has an effect on the body that results in us adapting to those experiences and, you know, trying to learn from them and get on in some way because we're supposed to, right? And then over time, we start to, especially with sexuality, there starts to be this, you know, don't talk about it, don't do it, shame component across multiple different facets of culture that make it really uncomfortable topic for a lot of people, even though it's an obviously essential part of life because it's where we all came from, right? So it's not, it's not something we can really avoid talking about. Um, and yet we we create this uncomfortability, which creates this shame of trauma around it, which creates more of this adaptive learning that over time ultimately is completely not serving us. And it's stuff that we had to learn to get through or it was important to learn at different times of our lives to adapt in that way. But that adaptation has an effect on our bodies. It is actually changing the way our bodies are functioning that in a lot of ways is actually preventing us from having meaningful, intimate, and safe sexual experiences with people that we want to, right? Or even just regular authentic human connection. Right. Yeah. And it's not like, that's just the beginning. Like having a meaningful connection should be baseline. Like to, in my my opinion, right. in my world, it's like we've lost this ability to connect, to be intimate, to love, or to remember how to love. And that is all just foundation. And then from there, there's the, well, what's erotically possible? Like, 
like you said, you know, sex, we're all a product of sex. We're all here because of sex. If we demonize sex, we demonize all of humanity. And we see what happens when we believe inherently that we are bad and wrong and monsters, you know, that we're not good. And if we don't believe that we're good, then we don't behave in a way that reflects that. And then we go into, then we've got the body shutting down. Then we've got this lack of pleasure in life. So you know, life is here. My belief, my life is here. Our aliveness is our eroticism. Eroticism is life force. It is this fundamental part of our humanity. And as soon as we've cut that off from ourselves, we've cut off aliveness. We've cut off joy. We've cut off some of these emotions that bring us closer to who we are and closer to ourselves, our truth of ourselves. Yeah. That pleasure that comes from just being right? Mm-hmm. Just being yourself and feeling safe enough to do that, right? What's interesting is a theme that I, I know from hearing you talk and, and from also talking with you today is just this idea of safety in all ways being so important to us being able to just experience life and not judge, not protect all the time, right? And guard ourselves and also have the experiences of, you know, real human connection, like genuinely bonding with another person without right. fear of what that person could do to you if you're vulnerable or how that person could take advantage of you or what they want from you. Or that was one of the most interesting things for me being, you know, growing up in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area, and then moving to New York was that um, on a personal note, it was really funny. I, got to New York and I I was in college and I started talking to all of these people that I knew people, you know, new friends. And, and I was very friendly, apparently more friendly than most of my people that I met to the point where, you know, people were, would start to ask like, what is Dave like looking for? Like, what does he want from me? And I'm like, people are like, like he doesn't want anything. Like he just wants to be your friend. Like he's, he's just from California. Like people are different out there. You know, <laughs> I started to understand that, 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 way of connecting that I felt safe enough to do was not something that other people had around me and experienced. And it was foreign to them. It was really, and I see that even also with my American friends that interact with Canadians, right? It's also like a similar thing that happens because Canadians are often so nice. You're listening to The Psychedelic Report. You know, can we talk about safety for a minute? And and how does that kind of unlock access to some of the things that that you're talking about and human I think one of the things that you're pointing to that I find really interesting is feeling safe in our own bodies, feeling safe in our own skin, and that we each have a different experience of that safety based upon, like you're saying, where you live, race, gender. Um, you know, I'm always interested to see like, well, how, how, you know, when did you last feel threatened and how many people who are in a vulva body will raise or a marginalized body will raise their hand, like in the last, you know, 10 minutes. And so, but it's been like six months for somebody else in a different body. And so I think it's important for us to just notice, to note, how often do I feel safe in my body here on this planet, in my body, do I feel safe right now? And to start to note when you don't and first have that level of awareness of, well, what has me feel unsafe? What has me feel dysregulated in my nervous system that I'm not feeling that, you know, parasympathetic and instead I'm getting the fight or flight type of response. And so that's the first step, just the awareness. And then the second is there isn't an external that can help you feel safe, which is kind of a taboo thing to say. I think that we can create safety for one another. I think absolutely like somebody who's really regulated can create safety for someone who's dysregulated. And yet safety is an inside job. What is it, you know, that's happened? We were talking about the the traumas, you know, how did you adapt that your system is always looking for danger, that you're stuck in hypervigilance? What are some things that you can do like toning the vagus nerve? You know, I, I hum every morning. I have a practice of singing every morning as a way of toning vagus nerve. I also do cold exposure as a way of toning the vagus nerve. There are also herbs that can help tone the na- vagus nerve. And so these these kinds of practices that for me, you know, growing up, I grew up very in a very traumatized situation, childhood trauma, PTSD. I had CPTSD diagnosis. And every day my life felt like it was threatened. So my nervous system adapted to always being on guard all the time. I never felt safe, even with my partner who loved me. 
who I had been with for 15 years, I still saw him as an abuser. Mm -hmm. The more somebody loved me, the more my, my trauma would actually come out because I did actually, there was something in me that felt safe for me to react and respond huge, you know, reactions that were nothing like if he raised his voice just a little bit, he was being abusive, you know? And so this dysregulation that was happening in me became my own responsibility to heal the trauma, to look at how I had adapted to do practices, to do the work, to do the healing, um, to help myself. And I was fortunate in that I do have socioeconomic status where I could seek out a lot of help and a lot of support. Not everyone has that. So I do want to just acknowledge my privilege there, but being a woman and indigenous culture, my mother was indigenous, part indigenous and, and having that feeling all the time and then being able to overcome it to where I don't have that feeling all the time. Mm -hmm. Such a huge difference. So if anybody's listening to this and they're like, oh my gosh, I have, you know, like an A score that's super high, or I have, you know, had, I have so many marks against me. You know, I used to say all the time, I was dealt a really bad hand in this lifetime. And now I don't see it that way. I don't see it that way at all. I saw it. I now see it as an, this was an opportunity for me to awaken to myself and everything led here to this beautiful moment and uh, discovery of who I really am. And that, that in, inherent in that was the healing along with, you know, changing my brain, changing my chemistry, changing my nervous system. So um, yeah, I was told I'd never heal. I was told yeah. that I would always be dealing with CPTSD symptoms. I was completely resistant and happy to stand here today to say, I no longer qualify for any of that. Yeah, that's really incredible. And, and I really appreciate you feeling safe enough to share that story because I think it's really inspiring for a lot of people to hear that this is possible. And, and to go back to your point around the vagus nerve and, and toning the autonomic nervous system is really important to understand as a path, like the, it's like the path primary guidepost for healing on the journey. And that things that we do that activate the vagus nerve, uh, which are numerous, like everything from soothing touch and soothing music and, and soothing, slow, deep breathing act exercises and soothing, slow, stretching movements and, and movement meditations and Tai Chi and Qigong. And, you know, so many other things can all help activate the vagus nerve. And of course there's technologies that do it too. And things like Apollo, um, and all of these tools are available to us to help us train that part of the body by helping us feel safe and in control. Mm -hmm. uh, and and safety in a lot of ways from the neurobiological perspective that we were talking about earlier and these pathways that get trained in our brain that safety pathway is critical to boosting vagus nerve activity and over time that activity gets stronger and i think it's a really you know there's two beautiful things about it one of which all of the techniques i just described are free Right. Mm -hmm. And so that's, you know, fantastic news and sleep, of course, just getting good, restful, deep sleep and restorative sleep. That's another big one. That's huge. And feeding your body like good, nutritious food that's ideally organic and doesn't have a lot of, you know, processed stuff in it, that all of that can be helpful to supporting these overall health things. But the other thing is that that's so beautiful about this is the idea that as we train our nervous system by boosting our vagus nerve activity over time, you can measure it number one, by looking at things like heart rate variability, just by wearable technology, for instance. And it's almost like telling a story that if trauma is one or multiple experiences that leave us feeling afraid and threatened over time, then we can retrain our bodies to adapt in the way they're supposed to that's best for us by boosting safety over and over mm -hmm. again, right? Mm -hmm. And training ourselves to remember as you said, about how to be and how to be ourselves and how to feel safe in situations that we might have been trained to not feel safe in before, including in relationships. To bring it back to sex, um, that I find really interesting is sex can downregulate, you know, it, can, it has both upregulation and downregulation, but um, it is something, an orgasm, you know, it creates new opportunities in the brain. And so we we can utilize sex as a tool for helping ourselves regulate. And so a lot of people avoid it, do it when they're in pain, like, oh, I have a headache or, oh, I'm stressed. And so we avoid sex when actually sex is a thing that helps us, another thing that can help us to downregulate. 
What's also interesting is the brain has this thing called the dual control response model. And so in dual control, the brain is always scanning for what is sexually re relevant all the time. It's going, okay, does this turn me on? Does this turn me off? Should I be turned on? Should I be turned off? And we talk about it sometimes like a car. Emily Nagaski talks about this in her book, Come As You Are. Like one is like putting the brakes on. It's the inhibitor part of the brain. And one is putting the gas on. But you also have the parking brake, the emergency brake. And some of us are riding around with that emergency brake partially on all the time yeah. when it comes to our sexuality. So it, it explains a lot in terms of, okay, if I'm hyper stressed, my inhibitors might be on all the time. If I'm living in cortisol, if I'm living in this lack of feeling safety, I'm I'm always riding around with that emergency brake on. Then sometimes though, we get too much accelerator and we don't have enough break. You know, trauma can go either way. And sometimes then, then we get like sexual compulsion and we get this, like, we don't know when to stop. And so then we start to feel out of control in our sexuality because we don't have the, so we need this really beautiful harmony in the system between the accelerator and the break to know, okay, I can let off now of that break because I'm in a safe space. It's appropriate for me to be having an intimate encounter or, you know, it's not. So let's, let's put on the break a little bit. What I find interesting in this is that 20% of people, when they get stressed, they feel more like that unsafety. There's more activation in the system. They want to have sex. So it becomes, it's like a, a different way of adapting. Like we talk about fight, flight, you know, feed, fuck can also be one of those. So like that's an adaptation of I'm stressed. If I have sex, then I feel better. And that was definitely me. So I had this adaptation that was, and and I I love that adaptation in some ways because it doesn't matter how stressed I am, how hard I'm working, I will always be turned on. <laughs> so, and then, and then that like brings me relaxation, like, okay, I have sex. And then I'm like, oh, I feel so much better. But for 80% of people, it's the opposite. If they are stressed, if they feel that tension, that lack of safety, they're going to now have more inhibitor and they're going to turn off. And so, but it's, so it's interesting. It's just like, watch that. I think it's something for another thing for us to become aware of just like safety is like, oh, do I have too much inhibitor going on? Because no matter how much accelerator people try to do all these sex techniques and all these things that like improve their sex lives. But if you've got your foot on the brake, no matter how much accelerator you go, your car's not going anywhere. So I think it's just something again, like let's be aware of how much brake you have on. And is that, can you have more harmony between this accelerator and brake system? Yeah, that's a great metaphor. And have you seen people retrain their adaptation? Absolutely. Yeah. As we start to unravel, I think that there's multiple things that we look at when we look at how we develop sexually. So that we need to just deconstruct and uneducate ourselves. I ask people all the time, how much education did you get about sex? And most people in most audiences will not raise their hands. You know, most of them didn't get a sex education. And I argue you did get a sex education. We're always getting sex education. We're always forming beliefs about our bodies and, and who we are sexually and who we're supposed to be sexually and what's okay and what's not okay, what should inhibit us. And so part of it is deconstructing the belief systems that you've created around this thing that we call sex. And I even like to expand the definition of sex. Sex isn't just intercourse. There's outer course. There's all the lead up to this, this thing that we consider the main event. But for a lot of people, it's not the main event. It's like, who said that intercourse is the main event? Who said that that equals sex or that that equals successful sex? So I like to expand it really that sex is this tool pleasure is this tool. It's a fuel for our lives and our aliveness, as I talked about, but also for our own awakening on this journey of life. Just like psychedelics can be a tool for our own awakening and expanding of consciousness and exploration of consciousness, sexuality is also a tool for the expansion of consciousness and ecstasy and getting to who we are and, and exploring these expanded states. So I get really excited about talking about that topic because sometimes I kind of lose what I'm talking yeah. about because I even start to feel it as I just talk about, because sex has been, I never did psychedelics or explored any of that when I was younger because I had sexuality. It was such a place of exploring myself and my consciousness. And I really owe, owe it to a lot of my healing of trauma and a way that I regulated myself. 
You're listening to The Psychedelic Report. That is fascinating. And since this is The Psychedelic Report, you know, it would be great to talk about what you just brought up, which is when we see what's happening in the brain, when we know about the neurotransmitter pathways that are activated when somebody takes a psychedelic medicine, whether it be it, you know, psilocybin, MDMA, LSD, what have you, that are activating serotonin, dopamine, endorphin, oxytocin receptors, and, you know, in some cases with ketamine, endogenous opioid receptors, right, endocannabinoids, there's all this huge cascade of neurotransmitters happening, uh, epinephrine, etc. And then these are also similar to what happens when we experience soothing touch from a loved one, or when we have sexual, a sexual experience with somebody. And the the psychological perspective around vulnerability and the idea of what psychedelic means is also really interesting, right? Because psyche means mind and delos means to show or to reveal. So we're really talking about having an experience that's not necessarily drug induced, but drugs could get you there. Other natural things could get you there, meditation, et cetera. But you're getting to a place where you're revealing parts of yourself to yourself that you were not necessarily aware of before. And that right. is inherently psychedelic and sexuality and relationships and, you know, shared orgasm experiences with people to have together and things like that are seem just like incredible natural examples of these states. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Uh, yay. I love talking about this. <laughs> so um, just from an early age, I got really involved in tantric sex and um, was very curious about these ecstatic states. Like, well, what's possible? You know, what is erotically possible? What can we do with these instruments of our bodies? Because we have endogenous chemicals, you know, our bodies produce these chemicals. And I, I became fascinated with like the pineal gland and the idea that the pineal gland ejaculates. And what does it ejaculate? What's this fluid that's coming from the pineal gland? And how are we utilizing, you know, sexual energy and cerebral spinal fluid and the brain? And I was like 19 when I was geeking out on these kind of topics and, and Kundalini. And, and so what I've seen in my own practice, I've been in practice for over 30 years now. And I mean, I could say I've been doing it my whole life because I was the kid who taught everybody where the babies came from, really, you know, and like, yeah. it wasn't the stork, everybody, <laughs> but, but really exploring these, these states and where sex could take us at that moment of orgasm and could i prolong that moment of orgasm so that it's it's not just a climax but it becomes an orgasmic state where right. i'm now starting to be in these expanded states and and utilizing breath and sound and movement and intention and how am i moving sexual energy through my body these were just some of my explorations very early on and then you know, my CPTSD stuff got really intense in 2000. This was 2017. I'd had my brain scanned by Dr. Daniel Amen and, you know, gotten these diagnoses and saw like what was going on in my brain and my blood flow and, and how I had adapted and some of the superpowers of that, which were really great. And some of the things that I still was really struggling with again, that they'd say like, oh, you'd never, you know, you're just never going to cure. And so that was when I started with psychedelics because I met someone who was like, yeah, I cured my CPTSD. I'm like, how did you do that? You know, <laughs> what happened there? And she told me the story. And I, at that time, was still like, you know, 1980s, your brain on drugs. I had the fried egg in the pan image just so like ingrained in me, you know, and I had my own endogenous chemicals that I'd been exploring these things with. And like you said, but then there's things that you don't know, like to meet yourself to like that are so deep in there and i love some of stan groff's work and what he talks about about experiencing the unexperienced like there were things at the level of trauma that i had had that i just would loop on or that i just couldn't access that i just couldn't get to no right. matter how much therapy or things that i had done and so i started researching and started searching for someone that could help me you know looked into maps and i had my very first session and and I, and I want to talk about something here too, because we've been talking about trauma a lot and being trauma informed, but I also think that there's a lot of value in being pleasure informed and that pleasure is healing and that being in pleasure was healing. And there was still a part of me that didn't quite understand that still. And until my very first session and I had never had MDMA before and had it, took the medicine and I'm there, I'm kind of waiting and it's coming and I'm like, I don't like this, you know, right away. My mind is just like, what is this feeling? Ah. And, um, and then I remembered, you know, some of my tools, I have breath, I have, 
you know, there are things that I can do that I've been practicing my whole life that I can bring into this and find the pleasure in it. Cause that's been part of my exploration in my life. No matter what it is, can I find the pleasure in it? Can I accept this moment and find the pleasure? And that session, you know, I found another layer of my own self and of my own sexuality, just being the being that I am because I sex is my dharma in the world. You know, of course that's going to come into my session of a maturing of myself. And my session lasted for 15 hours. That is abnormal. That was me for some reason, like all my breath work and everything. I just like went for it. And I have not had a CPTSD symptom since that. And I had crippling nightmares. You know, I talked about my partner and I, you know, like seeing him as an abuser and I could see like the love between us, like all that fell off and I healed in pleasure. It was not hard to go back with the, you know, with that medicine and all the serotonin and everything in my body. It was not hard to go back and see the root of my trauma. For me, it was an existential trauma. It was a trauma with God. How could God let this happen to me? You know? <laughs> and, and to understand what is this game we're playing, you know, and, and that, and soon after I did a couple of more sessions, you know, I had a mystical, complete mystical experience that gave me the answer to that question. How could there be a God that could let these bad things happen in life? And I saw the whole cosmic divine Leela, the, the dance of consciousness itself. And, and that was so healing for me. You know, I've learned since that that isn't something that happens for everyone. And it doesn't matter if that happens for you or not, you know, you can, you still have healing. But I think that the biggest message I got out of this was that healing doesn't have to be hard, that we can heal in pleasure and that pleasure is actually healing in and of itself to just be in these states where our bodies are washed with pleasurable, feel good hormones. And that's beautiful and amazing. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's one of the most common misconceptions about health and healing because healing in the Western model is not often thought of as pleasurable and it's often painful, you know, and it does result in powerful results at the same time. You know, there is a pain component in that healing process but I think it's a nice metaphor also for what we're talking about, right? Because when we're healing from emotional pain from the past, like, like your trauma with God that you described, right? There's a certain pain and vulnerability of admitting that and accepting that within yourself and even just confronting it, right? And just drawing your awareness and being like, wow, that was something that I've been thinking about for all this time. I really love that you brought that up because that's one of those things that so many people have been thinking about and just don't even realize that that could have been a thing for them. Something like that, which most people would never even consider a trauma, right? Like that wouldn't even make the definition in most people's brains. And yet it is in fact manifesting in the same way in your body that then you're able to feel safe enough to, to, to meet it head on. And, and there might be a painful part of that at first, but then you face it, use the Buddhist metaphor, right? You like put your head in the mouth of the beast and then the beast kind of vanishes and you're back, you know, to your whole complete self without that there the whole time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think this is what happens with our sexuality. We cut off pieces of ourself and then that piece gets tucked away somewhere in some closet of our psyche that we don't want to look at or can't access because we've tucked it away so deeply um, yeah, I had a ketamine session. This was later on when I was like, okay, there's another little layer. And um, it was like locks unlocking. It, that's all it looked like was just this huge door with tons of locks and they were all rolling and then it unlocked and it got that like what I call like my final piece. Maybe there's more, I don't know, but there's you know, always more. <laughs> and it's like, it's like, oh my gosh, like here's this thing I locked away so deep. Oh, oh, you know, but but it was there. And so I see that commonly, you know, people talk about there was a lock or there was a door. There's like these metaphors in our psyche. And especially with sexuality, I think sexuality is one of those places where it's like, let's put all the stuff we don't want to look at deep away. We've done it as a culture, as a collective. Let's put all the shadow aspects of it. Let's put all, and that's why we have all these shadow aspects is because we're suppressing so much. It has to come out some way. Yeah. So it comes out in the shadow, you know, where are those places in you? What are the pieces of you that you've locked away? 
And how can we reintegrate them into sexual wholeness? And my belief is that we can all do that process. We can all come back to sexual wholeness. And that is the journey of sexual awakening. And I believe that sex can lead us to the same places that psychedelics can um, in many instances. And then what I think is the conversation that we need to have around psychedelics and sexuality, which are two very taboo topics. Thank you, Dave, for having this conversation, because, you know, it's a... I think that we don't want to put these two two things together. We don't want to talk about these things two, two things together because, oh my gosh, two taboos. I know my own licensure. I went to them because there were things in my licensure about no drugs. And I was like, well, can we talk about this? No drugs piece? Um, because they didn't want to touch it with sexuality because it's hard enough to get the conversation about sexuality out. Now we're going to add psychedelics to it. Right. And thing I see in the psychedelic community, but then, you know, at the MAPS conference, oh my gosh, the, the talk on sexuality, there were people out the door, like there were so many people you couldn't even like sit in the room because I think people do want to have this conversation. And I think that there are ways with both sex and psychedelics, where there's so many things that we can learn from each other and intersect in terms of ethics, in terms of creating safety to the best of our ability. So we have safer, sane, you know, consensual conversations here. Because if as soon as we put it under the rug, it has to come out somewhere. And sex is going to come up. Sexual healing is going to come up. We have so much sexual trauma that can be benefited from the work with psychedelics that I feel like we need to be having these conversations and we need to create safer containers so that pleasure can become part of more of a part of healing. Yeah, absolutely right. And I'm very well said. And I, you know, I think that the idea that of what you're talking about is that shame, the more we shame ourselves or shame things that have happened to us and therefore ourselves, or that society shames things and shames us, then we, the more deeper down, we bury a lot of that stuff, right? Because we don't even feel safe enough to even go do a second look back or a third look back, right? So it's even harder to access. And so these some of these experiences, it sounds like from what you're describing, and we see this with our clients all the time in, in ketamine assisted therapy, where they're having really similar exper experiences, effectively like the unlocking of awareness to things that they didn't even realize were part of them before. Once they realize it, they're like, oh yeah, I remember that thing. But you know, it could be decades before people, you know, with people actually not consciously being able to recall anything to do with this, this stuff. And so I think there's a lot in common between from what you're hearing, you know, everybody's hearing, you know, I think this, the conversation is very clear that psychedelic experiences be them accessed by, you know, intimacy and sexuality, and also through psychedelic psychoactive medicines can get people into similar places with the right safety in the right environment, right? You know, where that lends itself into is, is when you start to combine these two taboo topics, as you said, which are interesting because they come with a ton of collective shame, each of them. <laughs> right? Abstinence only education has really been focused on those two things, right? Just don't do it for both. And we've seen over the last like 50, 60 years or more now for drugs that that just doesn't work. Like people are going to want to fuck and they're going to want to do drugs. And that's just the way people are, just the way people are. It's been going on for centuries, for millennia. There's nothing new about it, right? So we need to figure out how we're going to have this conversation. You're listening to the psychedelic report. You know, I think when it comes to psychedelics, it's particularly challenging because, you know, I think the precedent of them, I will say, from MDMA therapy back in the 70s and 80s is that it was used for couples therapy before almost anything else, right? And that's couples therapy that was that was not physically focused. It was like mental emotional bonding on the couch right. with clothes on, right? <laughs> with somebody else, the therapist in the room and or two therapists in the room. And I, that worked incredibly well. And so that's kind of how that started being explored, which I think is absolutely fascinating because of the way that MDMA in particular and similar medicines like MDA also have this ability to augment our ability to empathize with each other and to, you know, form that mutual understanding that we're, we're both human and, and we have the same wants, needs, and desires, and that, you know, so much more in common than we do different. Um, but then there's, of course, the increase in vulnerability that is healing in those contexts of safety, but that can also be dangerous in contexts where there might not be a proper supervision or a well-trained therapist or, you know, people might accidentally self-dose and take too much as a topic we don't need to cover today. 
but that you know when you increase your vulnerability you can increase your suggestibility right your ability to be convinced of things which i think people are a little bit afraid of and so how do we you know this is a constant challenge i don't think we have the answer yet but in your opinion how do we kind of walk that line and help people understand how these can be used safely together yeah, well, one of the things I think in terms of what we've learned in sexuality is sexuality. I think we kind of ha- still have a wild west thing with psychedelics too. And is what is the code of ethics? What are we creating? That's a code of ethics that leaves space for pleasure and sexuality to be part of the experience and conversation. And what are the consent conversations that are happening before anyone takes any medicine? And I even say this with sex. I mean, once you get into high arousal states, you're drunk. You know, you're in a, you're in an expanded state of consciousness. So you don't want to consent to something when you're in that expanded state of consciousness that then you're going to regret later and have consent regret. And so before you start, before you start anything sexually, before you start anything, taking any kind of substance that may alter your chemistry, what's the conversation that you're having? And we have in my, in my work, when I'm working with a client, we have sometimes an hour long consent conversation with a couple who's been married for 20 years, who's never had a consent conversation about what they want to do, what they don't want to do, what's off limits, what's on, you know, what's on. And you don't want to create so many boundaries in relationship that it deadens things. You want to have aliveness, of course. But I think at the beginning, when you're learning safety, especially if you've had trauma in your background and you're learning how to regulate, these consent conversations are vital. So some things to talk about in your conversation is what's off limits? What are your hard, no way, this is a boundary, you know, things like, are your clothes going to stay on? Let's say you're at home and you're, you're exploring MDMA with a partner for the first time, something like that. And it's like, okay, are your clothes going to stay on? Is it okay for clothes to stay off? What parts of the body do you not want touched during this exploration or do want touched during this exploration? What are things that you're setting out intention wise? And I think that in, you know, sometimes people are like, oh, no, you know, don't set intentions, but intentions were so powerful for me and such a big part of my healing. And I feel like having an intentionality around something brings in some of our ancient culture and some of our ritual and indigenous teachings of what are we doing this for? Why are we here? How are we in relationship with this medicine in this experience and in relationship with sexuality in this experience? Because why are we having sex? Are we just having sex for pleasure? Which is great. Like there's no judgment about that. But one of my shamanic teachers, he said to me, you know, we have recreational or we have recreational. And I really loved that idea. I've never been a a big recreational type of person in general, like with sex, with anything. And there's not, again, nothing wrong. There's no judgment on recreation because I think that there can also be value in that experience. However, recreational with dance, with drum, with music, with sex, with these medicines, how are we being recreational? I think that comes back to bringing some kind of intention, some kind of ritual to it, some kind of container. I I often speak about what is your container in which you're playing? If we don't know the container, our systems don't feel as safe. So I think that these are places to begin. Yeah, I think that's a great place to start. Um, Consent and just you know, starting to have these conversations in advance in your complete sober, you know, regular mind state is definitely a great place to start. And I think one of the things to learn about ourselves that, you know, we can bring in from, I'm sure your world and, you know, personally from as an addiction and trauma psychiatrist, you know, one of the big differences that results in any activity becoming an addiction or a dependency, which does happen with sex and it does happen with gambling and drugs. And also we see people have healthy relationships with those things all the time, right? And so, you know, I think one of the things that we see that results in a much higher increased likelihood of discomfort and and suffering and addiction dependence, including with with sex is when it's used, sex and drugs, is that when they're used as an escape from life. Right. And I think that another way to think about the recreate, recreate concept is, you know, are you doing this thing in terms of intention? What is the intention that we're walking into the experience with, which is the most important thing and like probably one of the two most important things that we think about in our entire lives and understand is intention. Because to go back to what you're saying, intention is where we focus our human energy. 
Mm-hmm. Right. So it literally creates the manifestation of our goal. And if our human energy is focused or distracted or not aligned with what our goals are, we're not going to get to our outcome ever. This is going to be a really painful, annoying process. Mm-hmm. So to just echo that point that you made, intention is critical in these experiences. It doesn't need to be strict. It should be worn, as my friend Lauren Tao says, kind of like a loose fitting sweater that's comfy and you can move around in it, but it's not like a tight fitting corset. And I think that when you bring that intention in, you're able to really shape the experience. And, you know, pleasure doesn't have to be an escape from life. Like that's part of what what I hear you saying is that we have every right and deserve to engage in pleasure pretty much ideally and optimally on a regular basis for healing and engaging in having fun in life. It doesn't have to be an escape from pain right? A healing experience in and of itself, like the fun part of the process that we're all here to, to share with one another and, you know, and each other. And I think that's one of the beauties of psychedelic medicine is that it takes, I was talking about the dual control model response and the inhibitor for a lot of people, it takes the inhibitor off. That's that, that break that's been on that parking break that's been on that all of a sudden, and that's a great intention. If you're like, you know, I just, want to help my inhibitors relax. That can be a really great intention. And in that, when that relaxation happens, then I can allow the pleasure and that pleasure can be healing and that pleasure can be expansive. That pleasure can be a place where I'm exploring my consciousness and who I really am as an erotic being without all those layers that I've needed to deconstruct. It can be an easy way to help us deconstruct some of those layers that have us in, in, in inhibition. And then one other point I want to talk about just in creating safety in these in psychedelic community and at home, but also working, you know, as psychedelic therapy is becoming more and more prominent and legalized is has the practice, if you're really wanting to explore sexuality and you're really wanting to explore your pleasure, has the practitioner you're going to done their own work in sexuality? Because <laughs> if it's still a big shadow, if it is still a place where they're working and then again, hey, we are all doing our work. There's no like judgment here on it. But that may be something for you to consider is what has been the journey of the practitioner around sexuality or is there suppression and what are the viewpoints where that could come out sideways? And that's where we, again, we see these challenges, even within the sexuality industry. You know, we've had a lot of that where a therapist, it comes out sideways and they interact with a, a client in a non-consensual way that isn't that re-traumatizes them. And often it's because there hasn't been, there's undealt with unhealed stuff within the practitioner themselves. Yeah, that couldn't be more true. Uh, And we see that in mental health across the board, even with regular general mental health practitioners. You know, I think one of the things that it used to be required mandatory for every single psychiatrist physician to have their own psychoanalysis and or psychotherapy anywhere from like one to five days a week for their entire time in training. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's not required in most places, training places anymore. So I don't know. I don't think it's required at all. So, wow. you know, it's also something to think about, you know, we, almost all of my colleagues that work in the mental health space, whether they're psychologists, social workers, psychiatrists, they all go to therapy and they do the work themselves because the more we're aware of the baggage we're carrying when we walk into somebody else's room, right? Right. The more we can understand how to leave that at the door and focus on the stuff they're carrying. Yep. And are you having supervision? You know, like I, it's really important for me to have a team. You know, I have my own personal work. I have my supervision so that I can go, oh, something's coming up for me, you know, with this client. And like, how do I work with that? And it's so helpful to me. It helps me serve my clients so much better when I can recognize, oh, there's some countertransference there or transference and, and have somebody who can reflect back to me who's on my team, you know, oh, have you thought about this? Or what about this piece in you, you know, so that... I think we're healing as a collective, not just the therapist and the client. It's communities healing. It's it's learning again how how we love each other, how we are here for each other, and that I think that takes a village, not just two people, you know, in isolation. Yeah, you absolutely nailed it. You know, I want to thank you again for just taking the time to join us today. I know how busy you are, uh, and I want to make sure we don't end without talking about your exciting new book that's coming out. Uh, December in the US and uh, February in the UK, your blueprint for pleasure. Can you tell us a little bit about that before we wrap? 
Yeah, part of my work over the last 30 years has also been, who are we as erotic beings? That's been one of my big questions. And I decided, you know, there's like the five love languages or the disc profile or the Enneagram, like how do we talk about sex? How do we know ourselves better? And so I created um, the five erotic blueprints. There's five types. And I'll just, I'll run through them really quickly. So there's energetic, and that's someone who's turned on by anticipation, space, tease. Um, even in psychedelics, it's really interesting. Like I, I've been thinking about like, oh, which one's more energetic? Which one has like that, those qualities of being like deep in the field and we're in all the anticipation and we're in mystical, like th that's very much of the energetic and that people are turned on by that. And then the sensual. So like MDMA, so sensual, you know, like you want to touch and you have that like cuddly feeling. So the sensual is turned on more by more of that like body to body connection, whereas the energetic one's space, just total spaciousness. Then we have sexual and the sexual is someone who's turned on by what we think of as sex in our culture. So that's, you know, penetration, orgasms, getting getting right to that, that, that sexual act, that limited definition that I talked about. And then we have kinky and kinky is someone who's turned on by the taboo. So whatever is taboo for you and the shapeshifter and the shapeshifter is someone who's turned on by all of it. It really is to me, the shapeshifter is what we all are. We just um, get conditioned out of these other areas. And so we, it shows us where we're limited. And so the book is really a discussion on and how do we determine who we are in a book about sexual awakening. So it's who are you in these five blueprints? What does that show you about your own eroticism? But also how do we unravel some of these mythologies and get to our wholeness, our sexual wholeness again? I love that. That's so important for society. And I'm so excited for it to come out. Thank you so much for having me. It's our pleasure. Thanks for listening to The Psychedelic Report. Visit us at thepsychedelicreport.com. This show is recorded weekly on Clubhouse with a live audience. The Psychedelic Report was brought to you by Apollo Neuroscience and produced by Future Medicine Media. While I am a doctor, I'm not your doctor. So please don't take anything you hear on The Psychedelic Report as personal medical advice because we don't know you. If you have questions about anything you hear on this show, please consult with your doctor.